Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of The Impact Factor. The Impact Factor is what happens when two scientists and two best friends get together to talk about video games. My name is Alex Samoha and I'm joined this week, as I am every week here on The Impact Factor, by the guy that, despite all his academic prowess and a week of reflection, still thinks the thing is better than Taskmaster. My co-host, Charles Fliss. Awesome as always to be hanging out with you, dude. And the thing is better. Someday, someday you'll see the light. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. Anyway, the impact factor is where I bring my perspectives as a biomedical scientist and combine them with, and sometimes against, Fliss's social scientist worldview to have great discussions about video games. We're striving to be the scientific journal of video games. So E3 is only one month away, so there's a lot to talk about. Let's get it started right away with some news and views. <laughs> In an academic journal, News and Views collects the best of recent events and findings. Here, Fliss and I scour through the week in video game news to find the stories with the biggest impact. So, Fliss, there's a lot to talk about, but what did you think was the most impactful story? Well, for this week, there's really only one choice, and that's the insanity happening over on Kickstarter right now, with Bloodstained uh, coming out that's a new, uh, what are they called, Igavania. Right, it, it's not it's not a Metroidvania now. It's an Igavania that's based on the famous producer and director uh, Koji Igarashi, who's started a Kickstarter. Uh, what I find exceptionally interesting about this is not just the way that this Kickstarter went from zero to more than five, more than reaching its five hundred thousand dollar goal in less than twenty four hours, but that now it's at the time of our casting, well over uh, a million. And in fact, I think it hit its stretch of a million and a half now, right? No, I think I think yeah, I think it's probably near one point eight million now. Last okay. I checked, which was the which was last night, it was at its you know it had one more stretch goal left, and now they're going to start having to make new stretch goals. But yeah, it's it's crazy with last week with ukulele and now this. I mean, Igarashi is a huge name, so it, it I mean it doesn't surprise me that his games are in demand. But what a phenomenal success! I was listening to another podcast. And that morning, they were like, oh, it raised 200000 in the first you know, hour it was up. And by the time that their recording had finished, so about an hour and a half later, it was already up to 400000 It had doubled its money in the course of you know, three hours. It's a huge success. Yeah, by the time it was posted um, that I saw it here, it, was, it had already surpassed the million dollars. That's when I woke up to look at it here, Japan time. It was well over a million dollars. And I was just like, oh man, well, I really hope they hit that stretch goal to add two players simultaneous co op. And by the time I was eating lunch, they'd already done that. So the speed at which this thing has been uh, accumulating money is incredible. Yeah, so let's take a step back, too. So Koji Igarashi is the Castlevania guy. So he was at Konami during a time when Castlevania was huge. He kind of made Castlevania what we know it today as, this Metroidvania style where you have this open map and there's exploration elements with boss battles and and items and then you get more powers that let you explore new areas of the castle. So really kind of inventing that. And he was behind the whole Game Boy Advance era and then especially what everyone knows him for is Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which many think is in the top five, top ten best games of all time. Uh, And I've dabbled in it and it's a phenomenal game and it has really kind of led the way for you know, it and Metroid combined have really made for this such a compelling genre with games like, you know, recently like Guacamelee that are just just exceptional. But Igarashi himself is a huge name, and I think this kind of goes to show some of the talent that Konami used to have, um, because he has such pull. Um, One of the things I think that's interesting about this Kickstarter, too, and we can get more into the genre itself, is that this Kickstarter wasn't a traditional Kickstarter in the way that a lot of them are, where they need money from the ground up. So Igarashi said in his video, which was hilarious, I don't know if you watched the Kickstarter video. I absolutely did. It was great. He turns into a bat and is torturing someone and is asking it, for It was money. amazing. It took me right back to growing up. Uh, just, you know, it, it felt like the kind of thing that I would have seen in the middle of Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah, it's like Goosebumps, the animated shows, like right, it, I mean, yeah. that, the, the live show's <laughs> intro. But yeah, but so he had already gone to investors, and because, you know, Konami and I guess other publishers had told him, nobody wants a Metroidvania game anymore. No one wants Castlevania, no one wants this gothic horror or whatever. And he found some backers, but the backers' uh, money was contingency on, we need to, you need to prove that there's fan interest, right? And so now he went to Kickstarter, 
and that's a five hundred thousand dollars, right? Because that's a such a small amount of money, right? You're not going to be able to make a game that you want Igarashi to make with five hundred thousand dollars. Not even close. But that, yeah, not even close. But the thing is, with that money, it proves fan interest, I guess. And as you can see now, it's sitting at one point eight million dollars. There's a lot of interest out there, and I I'm excited for that because I think hopefully that means that this game will be a success, and the talent behind the team leaves little doubt in my mind. Especially that they have other backers too, but you know could possibly fuel a lot more of these developers who've been told by publishers, "Hey, your game or genre isn't popular anymore," to go and try for it and see, look for this fan interest. Yeah, well, you know, I can't speak to a wide popularity uh, for the Metroidvania genre, uh, but what I can speak to is a very dedicated group of people who love it. You know, I you said you dabbled in Symphony of the Night. I love symphony of the night i think that game is incredible and as much as i love it as many hours as i've sunk into it uh, two of my really good friends here uh, who are just a, a bit older than us have spent even more time i mean they really legitimately grew up with that game and the the feelings of of passion that they have for that style of game but specifically for that kind of like you said gothic horror setting for that kind of game is incredible. And I think that's bearing out here in the Kickstarter and that what people are effectively doing here, if you look at the kind of low level rewards, is they are pre-ordering a game that has not been made yet. This is a game that is just now getting, like used to getting its investors and funding together and people are already buying it. And they're buying that solely on the cred of the man directing it. Yeah, and I, th I think we're gonna be seeing that more and more. I wrote a piece in my blog kind of talking about how in an increasingly crowded and increasingly noisy game space, the people who develop games are what matter. You need that name, you need that voice, you need that pull. And Igarashi is, you know, at least among the Japanese development scene, one of the biggest names that, you know, you can think of. Obviously, you've got, you know, the huge Nintendos uh, in the, the Nintendo figures, and then you have just that Konami. You've got Hideo Kojima. But Igarashi was such an influential figure, and I think, yeah, it's the name has sway, and he's had a proven track record of success. So, I mean, I'm I'm certainly excited to to see what comes of it because I just love that kind of Metroidvania genre. It's such a rewarding experience. The sense of progression, the sense of you know exploration, the great environments, the secrets, just the whole aesthetic. I mean, I love that kind of gothic horror. I mean. You know that I like Van Helsing, and I mean, that was not the world's best movie, but just aesthetically, the, that thing... It's the world's amazing. worst movie. No, it's not the world's worst movie, but... <laughs> it's not even close to the world's worst movie. Okay, but it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. I, I know you like that aesthetic, but come on. Hugh Jackman, there's, he can't do anything to save that movie. It's there's, it's there's so much already saving that movie. I mean, come on. It's got a Wolfman. It's got Dracula. It's got, it's got everything I hope is in, the, in Bloodstained. Like, it's it's fantastic. I think it's probably on the same level of Hansel and Gretel, Witch Slayers, or whatever that movie with Jeremy Renner that came out was. Yeah, that movie was a very similar aesthetic, was possibly, okay, I'll say it, it was worse than Ben Helsing, and I still really enjoyed it. So, like, that, I mean, I enjoyed <laughs> I, Frankenstein. That's how much I love this genre. Oh, my so, God. I'm so excited oh about this Oh, my God. <laughs> Just, just on an aesthetic level, I mean, that concept art is gorgeous. Oh, no, the game looks... I mean, if the game can look anything like the concept art that was put on the Kickstarter, that's it's going to be... It's going to look great. I mean, I, I have no doubt. But one of the things that's kind of interesting with these Kickstarters recently, kind of yesterday and today, and, you know, a little previously, is how many games are we going to get where they're basically spiritual successors to a, fran to a property that's owned by other people? Because, you know... But last year, we got um, Kenji Inafune with his Muddy Number no. 9, which is 100% Mega Man. The main character even looks like Mega Man, but it can't be Mega Man because Capcom still owns the rights. You got Ukulele yesterday from Platonic that, oh, you have a big thing and a small thing with wings, and it's a 3D <laughs> platformer, and it also kind of sounds like a musical instrument. And now you've got this Bloodstained, what is it? God, what's Ritual the of the Night. Is Ritual of the Not Night. Not Symphony of the Night. Ritual of the Night. Not to be confused with any musical performance. More a religious service or a 
ornate performance. Yeah, it's. But I mean, I think that they're completely aware. At least with Bloodstain, there's there's a real almost self parodying nature. I mean, like in that video, the moment where he's holding that glass of wine. I mean, he might as well have just said, "What is a man?" before smashing it on the ground. Like it was yeah. amazing. It was just <laughs> everything you could ever want. And so I I think that there's a demand for these games and I think part of the reason for that is the new consoles we have. If you look at the concept art, just like we were talking about, what people want is they want a new, prettier version of games they really enjoyed as a kid. And if the gameplay holds up, if they can do new things and create new experiences using this basic gameplay, I think people are going to keep wanting these spiritual successors. Yeah. I mean, I'm just looking forward to wrecked... Uh wrecked marsupial you know come on a 3d explorer <laughs> he can spin around he collects apple looking things i mean i'm okay with that uh, as long as he, we also get wrecked marsupial racing then, i mean uh, I wrecked marsupial happy. racing i think is gonna reinvent the cart racing and cart battle genre yeah but i just i can't i can't even express how much i would look forward to a game like that <laughs> yeah so that again just for anyone who missed that we're talking about Ko- koji igarashi's highly successful kickstarter uh for his new game, Bloodstained. But yeah, that's huge news, I'm really looking forward to following that. But I think the story that has the most impact for me, and something that's going to continue to have impact in these four weeks leading up to E3, is all of this E3 news. Um, But let's jump into our favorite news producers in the games industry, Nintendo. What an interesting week for them. Alright, so just to kind of put everything in perspective... Last time we talked, we had no idea what Nintendo's plans were for E3. They had previously this year talked about their new console that they're developing called the NX. There was an initiative they started where they're going to start they're going to team up with another Japanese company to create mobile games like uh, smartphone games. Unfortunately, we uh, the Zelda game for Wii uh, U was delayed, but we really had no idea what was coming into this. And so late last week. Iwata from Nintendo went out and said that he basically said everything that Nintendo wouldn't be talking about at their E3. Yeah, yeah. Which was, all he did was was tell us everything you want to hear about, we won't be talking about it at E3. Yeah, exactly. So let's just run through the list of everything they won't be talking about and everything they care about, which is, I don't even know why they teased some of this stuff. Why are you going to talk about the NX if it's like, here's the NX, we're working on it. Don't, hear, don't expect to hear anything until 2016. But so they're not going to talk about the NX. They're not going to talk about any mobile game initiatives. They're not going to talk about Zelda to any capacity. Uh, Nintendo's been working on some health initiatives, like that Vita sensor finger clamp they showed God knows how many E3s ago. And so... That was an accessory they wanted to make for the Wii when the Wii first came out. Yeah, exactly. And so that left us with, you know, before the news yesterday, what the heck are they going to talk about? So clearly Star Fox seems to be a big game for them. Um... And then Mario Maker, which has been confirmed for 2015 release, I think that's going to be one of their marquee games, but we can get into whether or not that's really a marquee game to get behind. Um, And then I guess they're teaming up with Universal to have a theme park. But So that led into the news yesterday, where they had a Nintendo Direct announcing what they would be, their E3 plans. And so it's pretty much what I expected, at least. Um, They announced that they're going to have their Nintendo Direct on Tuesday morning, just kind of showing games and developers they're gonna have their treehouse which is just basically their live show where they talk with they mainly do hands-on game demos but they talk to some devs they promise more devs but then the big news out of that was that they're going to be doing this nintendo world championship the first time in 25 years which is this battle royale of people competing against each other in nintendo games to win the ultimate prize so there's a lot to unpack here but flitz what do you think what do you think what part of the story you know, gets you the most fired up. Well, I think for for me, I'm still angry. Like I'm really excited about the Nintendo World Championships. I'm gonna I'm I'm, I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna have a really good time with it. But I'm still upset that basically at E3, what we're gonna be hearing about is a new Star Fox game that is not the Star Fox game that any of us want. Uh, we're we're not gonna be hearing about Zelda. We're not going to be hearing about the NX, which they tease almost just to make you not want to buy a Wii U if you were thinking about it. And then Mario Maker, which, I mean, why don't you tell us, what what exactly is Mario Maker going to be? Yeah, so Mario Maker looks to be 
the be all end all if we're going to go through with some PR speak of making Mario uh, a, a basically a Mario game maker engine akin to something like Little Big Planet. I assume it'll come stocked with classic levels um, from your your, Mario, your Super Mario, your classic Mario World, Mario Three. Uh, even they talked about how there might be some tools to develop more three D Mario's. Um, and then what really the power of this game is is they give you the tools to design your own levels. So to put in, put your blocks in, put your Goombas in in the exact right place, play through the level, post it online. So again, very similar to something Little Big Planet does, where they give you those creator tools and let you play through it. And so. You know, this is something that modders have been doing pretty much since the Mario games were released, right? Going through and, you know, modding levels, creating these super hard levels, these super funny levels where the blocks will make shapes. And so it's interesting. I think it's uh, good for Nintendo to acknowledge that there's a demand for this, and I think people will enjoy it. But as a marquee game, I'm just confused, right? It doesn't... Sure, any, any game you stick Mario on can be a marquee game, but it just seems strange. Like, I don't... Only like I mean, if the experience, my experience with Little Big Planet is anything similar to what happens here, and I suspect it will be, um, only the hardest of the hardcore design these design good levels and fun levels to play, and you kind of really have to sift through a lot of you know kind of garbage to get to some of the quality game experiences. And I assume the same is going to be here in Mario Maker. There's going to be really talented individuals who spend a lot of time making these Mario levels, but there's going to be a lot of garbage that is going to be out there floating around too. And I mean, I love the idea. I think their drag and drop interface using the gamepad um, is going to be interesting, but I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, I have two really big concerns here. The first concern is I I just read an article recently posted. I'm going to butcher his name, but Steven Totillo on Kotaku wrote an article called The Amiibo Problem. And she basically makes a point about, you know, if you don't want to collect Amiibo, there's not really a way for you to get access to the content that Amiibo unlock. Like, you can't, say, buy a download, you know, for five bucks instead of a $12 Amiibo. And so the, as soon as I read about Mario Maker, my first thought was, how many Amiibo do I have to buy to unlock all the content in Mario Maker? Um, yeah. You know, we were we were joking last week about it, a set of Olympic Mario, but it's not ridiculous to expect that there's going to be like five to ten Mario Amiibo by the time we're done talking about it. And I mean, they're money makers, right? So it wouldn't surprise me at all that they're thrown on and you can get access to exclusive, maybe like to Tanuki suit Mario or access to specific Mario villains. If you buy the blue shelled Koopa, you can put him in your levels. Right. So at what point? are the people who want to create these levels forced to collect an entire shelf of Amiibo, whether they're Koopa or Koopa Troopas or Koopa Paratroopas? Do you have to get both of the Hammer Brothers to use them? I mean... At and what, what about Dry Bones? Dry Bones! Yeah, right, and everything that he goes with. Does he unlock the desert level? And is that not just the creators, but the people who want to play them? Do I have to have the Amiibo to play their level? I mean, what was beautiful about Little Big Planet? It, the very the very first one when those big creator communities got started is that you went through the game on single player and that's how you unlocked the vast majority of the content and then if you wanted to unlock more of it you got some friends over to do that and then you went online and the game basically taught you how to build a great level by taking you through all these things of multiplayer online play to unlock all the parts and that's why we saw some incredible community develop levels and including that, Mario 1-1, which I think everyone has to remake in every game possible they can make it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like it's iconic, so yes, it has to be at everything from Minecraft to every single Little Big Planet and Little Big Planet karting. It has to be there. Um, but that leads me into my second real big concern here, which is that Nintendo so far has an absolutely horrible record of interacting with people who are creating using its properties. And look at what happened with the Nintendo Creators program on YouTube where we had multiple, not just one, but multiple very high profile YouTubers getting on to say they're taking so much of the money from this and it's so restrictive that we just won't be even touching Nintendo anymore. Yeah, I mean, Nintendo has not historically been good to its content creators. And sure, you're operating within the confines of you know Mario Maker, but what if you post a level where I'm sure it's going to happen? Your blocks form the shape of a penis or something like that, you know, something stupid like that. 
that's probably going to be disallowed and banned. And you know, I don't have a Wii U, but I've heard all the talk of there's such strict controls on what you can do and say in the we, you know, the Weverse or Meverse or whatever it's called. Yeah. Uh, any kind of thing that could be considered inflammatory is controlled. And so, yeah, it seems like there's this real dichotomy that's probably going to arise with Mario Maker. They want content creators. They want these people to be involved and playing around with the tools that they're given to them. But I'm sure people are going to use the tools in ways Nintendo didn't intend. And that's going to be interesting. And I think just, I mean, even stepping back from that, it's just, as a marquee game, really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean... One of my favorite levels that came out of Little Big Planet was a tank, um, and I don't know if they would allow that. Would they allow Mario to go through something that, that used something like that? I, I don't think they they would. And I think that basically what they're doing, and I think the reason that you're having such a negative reaction to this as a marquee game, is that this is a game that says go make your own fun. We're giving this to you, the community, to make it. They're outsourcing their marquee game development to the consumer. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I'm not saying it's not going to be a fun game. I'm sure it'd be great. I'd, I'd love to play around with it, too. If I had a Wii U, I'd absolutely pick up Mario Maker. It's a fun little game, but the emphasis there on the little, it's not something I would buy a console for, certainly. It's not something that gets me excited. It's not a new 3D Mario game. It's not Mario Galaxy 3 or some Mario, Super Mario 3D World 2 or anything like that. It's a smaller game, and it's just a strange, you know, it's, you know, last year... Nintendo had this partnership with Best Buy uh, around E3, where they'd have these Nintendo kiosks where you could play games. And last year was Smash Bros. And Smash Bros. is a huge game. Everyone, you know, loves to play Super Smash Bros. It's huge in the hardcore community, in the casual community, anybody who likes Nintendo. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a huge and fun game. And so that made sense as the kind of marquee game, the game that's given to the community. But at a Best Buy kiosk, what are you going to do And Mario Maker, are you going to make a level? Are you going to sit there and make a level? Again, I'm sure they come prepackaged with levels that are either replications of... You know, I'm sure there's going to be replications of classic levels, as well as some designers saying, look, look, this is some of the crazy stuff you can do with the tools. But yeah, it's just, it's just confusing. Yeah, I guess that's just what we're going to have to wait and see and see what it looks like when it actually is fully released. So kind of coming off of that then, to kind of try and distract us from everything they're doing wrong or not telling us about um we we do get this news about the nintendo world championship what do you what do you think about that yeah so i i i think okay i have mixed feelings from a hardcore i want new games new properties perspective but from a fan perspective and from a viewership perspective this is a great move i mean people love nintendo properties people love nintendo i people who don't even know things about games sometimes refer to games collectively as nintendo they have such sway. And so I think the World Championship is a good initiative. Nintendo has been trying to reach out with fans, and I think pretty successfully. I think that's why, I, the, in business, at least their console market is in business, because they're trying to tap into their fan base. And so this is a, I mean, it's a really cool initiative. I watched their intro video, which is just funny. Reggie fils is great at being goofy and poking fun at himself. He's like the director for Nintendo America. And, you know... I certainly want to stream it. I certainly want to see the competition. You know, it brings to mind what kind of games people might compete in. Um, for anyone who didn't know, myself included, I wasn't so sure exactly what Nintendo World Championship was. But this is this, this you know, triathlon or quintathlon or whatever you want to call it of uh, competitive games. You play through Nintendo games in a competition to win a grand prize. And so this is Nintendo, when the, in their heyday made this movie called The Wizard, or they worked with the studio to make a movie called The Wizard, and it's all about people competing, and the Power Glove, and going to the Nintendo World Championships, I think it was Fred Savage, and, you know, they got to the Grand Championships, and they're playing each other in Mario, and, you know, big spectacle, and so, I mean, it could be a really cool event, and Nintendo's even announced that fans uh, and people from around the world could qualify to be in this Nintendo World Championship, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but yeah, you can imagine there's probably going to be some uh, they want to advertise a new game that's coming out soon, Splatoon. I'm sure there will be some Splatoon uh, multiplayer matches. I wouldn't be surprised if there's Smash Bros. Maybe Yoshi's Woolly World will be there in some capacity. Maybe they have like speed run a level. And so I think it could be an interesting event. And uh, one of the things that I think could be the most compelling if Nintendo wants to do it is at the end of The Wizard, the big dramatic finale... It was Super Mario Brothers 3 was revealed. That was, oh my god, he won the prize and the new Mario game's coming out. 
And so that could be something that, that happened here. They could, at the end of the Nintendo World Championship, reveal a big game. I don't know what that game could be, because we already know about the Zelda that's coming out. Maybe a new Mario game, but that could be something to look forward to. Yeah, you know, maybe they're just baiting us with Mario Maker. They're, they, they're eating up our complaints. They're just like, just you wait. They're, they're, they're sitting there. Everything is proceeding exactly as we had foreseen. But you know what? The Nintendo World Championship really reminds me of is a video game, Legends of the Hidden Temple. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> there's certainly those parallels there. I would be surprised if there's, you know, trivia, but yeah, and this competition, it's going to be cool. But I think, kind of going back to what I said, though, I think they, there needs to be a reveal, right? So in Nintendo's Direct, what the heck are they going to talk about? What games are coming out in the Wii U this year that anybody cares about? Mario Maker and Star Fox? And they have to reveal some sort of big Wii U game that they haven't talked about yet, right? There has to be something. Yeah, I just can't think of what it will be. We know that they are quite happy to leave the Metroid franchise lay fallow. Yeah, and at this point, you know, with, with the news coming out of Kickstarter, any anything they try and do will just not live up to what, what the fans of those games are getting now. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Nintendo continues to confuse and befuddle. And so I just... I like the initiative that the Nintendo World Championship has, and it could be a really cool event. But, I don't know. Yeah, well, while we're on kind of a downer, uh, for me, Ubisoft is now no longer producing for last gen. And for those of you who don't know, I am a dedicated last genner. I have Chief not K. upgraded. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I have not moved on to the PS4 or Xbone. And until there are a couple more games are announced, released for those systems, I haven't planned to. I've still got a huge backlog on my PS3, but that backlog will not be added to by Ubisoft, which is... That's nice of them, right? That's, that's nice. That's, they don't want to give you any more games to, hold, to tie you to last generation. Yeah, so run, run us through this news. So they had a, they put out a statement, right? Yeah, yeah, Ubisoft put out a statement here, and they said that except for the kind of casual fun Just Dance game series, there will be no more PS3 or Xbox 360 development. Uh, they're going to publish the, the last few games that they've already announced for the last gen, and then they're going to push on to the current gen. So that means that all of their marquee titles, perhaps most notably Assassin's Creed, will no longer be developed for the PS3. And when they... I want to mention Assassin's Creed specifically uh, because in their last... their previous Assassin's Creed release, right, they had Assassin's Creed Unity, which came out for the current gen, and they had Assassin's Creed Rogue, which came out for the last gen. And I think part of the reason that they might be making this announcement is that Rogue was actually a much better game than Unity. And yeah. that, that was kind of embarrassing. So, it worked, right? Yeah. <laughs> People's faces didn't disappear, so there's always that. Yeah, so... Yeah, that, that, that glitch was amazing. I, I love every <laughs> video with that glitch. Um, there's the faceless people and the falling through the world. You jump off a building and just descend into oblivion. Was it just Slender Man appearing in the game? I don't know. Could have been. Scary stuff, man. Le Slender Man. It was in France, remember? Oh, right, yeah. Le Slender Man. Perfect. So, yeah, no, <laughs> so no more Ubisoft, no more Le Slender Man for me on, on my PS3. And for those few of my friends who continue to cling to their 360, no more Ubisoft for them either. Yeah, so, I mean, on the Assassin's Creed front, I mean... I think we're maybe not the best people to talk about it. I don't know if you've played any Assassin's Creed game. I haven't. I, You know, I, I played a free demo of Rogue and really enjoyed it. Um, but that was about all the Assassin's Creed I needed. Yeah, you, you'll get the idea. Yeah, so, I mean, as a current gen owner, I have a PS4. I'm kind of happy about this. Money bags! <laughs> <laughs> Money bags! <laughs> I guess, uh, but... My girlfriend's money bags. She got it for me as a gift. But yeah, no, so I think this is a step in the right direction because a lot of the times you saw us with the last generation too, game development gets, it's so much more expensive. It's so much more time consuming and often puts limitations on, um, on your, your, your graphical fidelity, how smoothly the game runs, how much content the game runs. Because you need to develop for both consoles at the same time, it's hard to make a PS4 version of a P, you know, a PS3 version of a PS4 game 
when you can't stream the open world because you don't, you know, the PS3 has, I think, 512 megabytes of RAM, and the PS4 has 8 gigabytes of RAM, right? So it's, it can often handicap you, and you can see that, right? Because just last year, like you mentioned with Assassin's Creed, they couldn't, Assassin's Creed Unity could not run on the PS3. Too many NPCs were moving around, too much of the world, open world was streaming, and so they had to spend all of that money to develop a PS3 game. Now, we we saw the end result that Rogue ended up being better than Unity, and I suspect that's for a number of reasons, you know, among which more comfortable developing for the PS3 since they developed for it so long, as well as, you know, it's my impression Rogue was, it's much more of like a, a ship, they really took the element, the ship sailing element from Assassin's Creed 4, and, uh, really kind of ran with that and everyone loved that element so it's not it's not surprising to me that it did better but i think it's a good initiative because when people stop having to care about developing these games for you know the ps3 the 360 i think we're going to move to a space where people can kind of trim the fat and spend especially or i guess in particular talking about the triple a front kind of trim the fat and really focus their development on the ps4 and start getting those uh you know graphical engine, open world, you know, whatever improvements that were kind of promised for this generation. Well, while I don't appreciate you referring to my beloved PS3, Natasha, as the fat, I, uh... <laughs> oh, I it's do... definitely the fat. Maybe it's the gri- Fine, it's the gristle. You want it to be the gristle? Who touched my gristle? Who <laughs> touched gristle? So, while I, while I don't appreciate that, I do appreciate you know, your, that, yes, this is a step in the right direction. That, in fact, as someone who's kind of waiting for there to be more of the games that I want to play in the quality I want to play them on the PS4, that this is actually the correct thing for Ubisoft to be doing, and that it is time to move on, and that we, when we see a generational shift in our consoles, we really do need to see more of a generational shift uh, in, in our games. And so I, I appreciate that they're doing that, and I, I'm... I mean... The 360 is 10 years old. The PS3 is 9 years old. Yeah. We were, in high, we were in high school when they came out, or something. Early college. Yeah, we were in high school when it came out. They were in high school. Come on, they're old. They've had their time in the sun. A decade of play, if you're assuming you bought it right away, that's enough. You're just gonna move on. I'm sure you're, you know, a lot is still gonna come out for the PS3. You're still gonna get... A lot of, you know, the indie games which can run fine there and they realize the market. Other developers, I'm sure, are still going to make for the PS3 360 generation. But I just like this initiative and hope that other people kind of just keep pushing games forward. Because you get those PC gamers, right, who complain about console gaming all the time by holding back, you know, the graphical uh, and your graphical potential and scope of new games because you... Because, you know, even the PS4 is far less powerful than, you know, your standard high-powered gaming rig. Yeah, but for um, me, you know, I'm always pushing for a more inclusive game community. And one of the biggest problems we have is the price barrier. And so having support for what is effectively an outdated system in the PS3 is really helpful in terms of giving people a way into the community, to, a way to play great AAA titles in, in, a, in a way that is affordable. And I... My, my brother, who is a dedicated PC gamer, really gets mad at me about this, but I just have no patience for PC gamers complaining about this stuff because if you're not rolling in money or spending all of your available expendable income on a gaming rig, it gets outdated so quickly that, that console really is a smarter gaming investment if, if you don't have that kind of money or time. No, I mean, I agree. I mean, I have never... Well, I used to be a PC gamer back in the... Math Rabbit Marathon <laughs> Descent Game. Yeah, I mean, days. I still play Total War. I love gaming on the PC. I'm just not a PC gamer per se. I don't have a huge gaming rig. I can't you know, afford I, a huge gaming rig. I mean, I think that's a point of disclosure for anyone who's listening to this too. You know, neither you, Fliss, nor I are big. You know, I have a laptop computer and I can play indie games and smaller games on it. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not playing Crisis Two on whatever Ultra or anything like that. I'm, that's not happening. Uh, but I think, I mean, because even though Ubisoft is developing now only for current gen, it doesn't it doesn't you know change your backlog really. There's still such a phenomenal catalog of games and a, a decade long catalog of games on the 360 and the PS3. And so I think that's plenty, right? You could there's more games than you could play in a lifetime, 
on either of those two consoles. And so I think it's just good to kind of always be moving forward as an industry. So, I mean, again, I'm biased because I have the next gen so I can get whatever game, you know, feasibly that comes out. But I, th- I, think it, I do think it's a step in the right direction. No, and I think that's a good point that even if you bought a PS3 today, there's already such a huge backlog of games that you would get your money's worth, especially at the prices that the PS3 has come down to. And yeah. this will hopefully drive the market forward and actually bring those prices down further. Yeah. But so speaking of games that could drive you to next generation, though, I think this next story was tailor-made for you. Yeah, man. I am ready for more Soul Calibur. I don't care if it's only on Facebook. I'm ready for more Soul Calibur. <laughs> so, so what happened? Okay, so... The Soul Calibur Facebook page posted a fan poll asking, what's your favorite character in the whole history of the Soul Calibur series, with the notable exclusion of guest characters, right? So no Spawn or Link or any of those. Dark No Darth Vader, thank God. Um, on Yoda? On this, yeah, or, Yoda, or or The Apprentice. Let's not even go Oh there. my God. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> broken characters. OP. Um, yeah. But they posted this poll with all the real Soul Calibur characters, and they said, okay, we're preparing something huge. We're not going to tell you what it is, but we're preparing something huge, and so we need to know what characters you like. And so now all of us diehard Soul Calibur fans are kind of running around in circles going, is it the next one? Is it the next one? Is it Soul Calibur 6? Is this what we're going to get? Are we finally going to recover from the disappointment of Lost Swords? Uh, it's gotta be right. <laughs> what what else is it gonna be? I mean, they, you can't tease something like this without it being at least big Soul Calibur console arcade game. Right, yeah, yeah. And if it could be, if we could be seeing Soul Calibur on consoles and in arcades, man, that would be just the best. I, I couldn't wait for that. So, I absolutely voted, I'm absolutely excited about this, and if they announce Soul Calibur 6, then yes, that will push me to PS4. If they would, by some grace of whatever almighty being or beings there might be announce a soul Calibur six themed ps4 like a special design even if it's just like the destiny one where it's a weird color and a little logo i will buy it that will be my ps4 are you listening out there because i will buy that that is the ps4 i want uh, he's not kidding this this kid loves soul Cal- you've played every single soul Calibur, right did you play every one soul Calibur. I, I play all the way back to soul edge before it was even called soul oh Calibur. My God. i played that in arcade I guess I guess we just for anyone listening, we never really said what it is. Soul Calibur is a 3D fighting game from pro- the development team Project Soul, which is a part of the larger studio Bandai Namco. Uh, it was a, Soul Calibur kind of was the first game of the series to really make it big. It was on Dreamcast, which is kind of what it's famous for. is one of the games on Dreamcast that really pushed the few people who bought a Dreamcast to actually buy I bought a, Dreamcast. a used Dream. I bought a used Dreamcast just to play Soul Calibur on it. Yeah, and then and then for me at least, Soul Calibur Two was really really refined all the engine. They refined the characters. They really found a fun balance of weapon skills and characters. And Soul Calibur Two for me was the big one. Yeah, well, and Soul Calibur Two also had one of the best single player modes of any fighting game that that there's been, just in terms of the weapon progression. And that's that's really key. We should mention that for Soul Calibur is that it is a weapon based fighting game. So instead of being a combat style game like Virtual Fighter or something like that, it's a game based on having different weapons. So you have people with nunchucks, you have people with giant swords, you've got people with smaller swords and with spears, lances, lance sword combinations, all kinds of really cool Okinawan weaponry, stuff like that. Really awesome stuff. Yeah, so I mean, I'm a big fan of Soul Calibur 2, or Soul Calibur as well, I guess I should say, to clear up any confusion. <laughs> um, but it's interesting uh, that that this game to you would push you to next gen because you know fighting games often aren't necessarily the best way to show off the power of a new system, right? You're not going to have huge crazy worlds to explore. You're not going to have like you know a racing game where every single car part is chromed and blinged and you can do it. So what is it just that you want to be able to play the next installment of Soul Calibur? What if say this new Soul Calibur comes out on PS3 as well? You know. If it came out on PS3, I would have to really sit back and think. I mean, if they came out with a Soul Calibur PS4, I would still buy that, and that would push me over the edge. But um, for me, it's just wanting to be able to play the game. Absolutely, I'm not. I'm not. I am a fan of the game. I'm not looking to see what the PS4 can do. I, I've already seen what a PS4 can do, and I'm impressed. And there are other games I would enjoy, 
but being just the ability to play Soul Calibur and play Soul Calibur right away is what would push me over. I, I should give my full disclosure here. I am a huge fighting game enthusiast. I'm not really great at any particular fighting game. I play He's not. basically He's not. every fighting game. Don't hate. Um, <laughs> and But I, I'm kind of mediocre at every fighting game. And I'm working very dedicatedly right now to becoming good at Street Fighter. I'm doing my 100 Hadoukens on each side every day. So I'm I'm getting there. Nice, um, nice, nice, man. New Soul Calibur would make me put Street Fighter down, and, and I'm going to get hate for that, but yeah, it would make me put Street Fighter down and play it as much as possible all the way through. Yeah, I mean, well, Japan does have a good history of having specialized PS4s for games, right? You've got that weird Dragon, Cle- Dragon Quest PS4 came out with a slime was on the front of it. Yep. I think there's a faceplate for, I think there's some Final Fantasy game or something. There's a lot of custom faceplates for the PS4, so I mean, I could see it happening. The real question is with this news, aside from the obvious, who did you vote for? We'll get to that in a second. But do you expect to hear something out of them at E3? Do you think this is a teasing for a possible E3 announcement? And if so, where are we going to hear it at E3? Yeah, that's a great question. I I hope this means we're going to hear something at E3, but... My experience with Ben and Namco and their announcements tells me that there might be a much slower turnaround. You know, that because that's a very fast turnaround from announcing this to collecting the data to announcing the game, right? Because having done this character poll, even if they announce the game, everyone's going to immediately say, well, who won the character poll? And are they going to want to announce that right away? I'm not sure. And I think that if we had a more dedicated space where I could see them announcing it, then, then yeah, I would be more on board with it. But I, like you said, I don't know where they would even talk about it. Be free. Yeah, because Soul Calibur. I mean, again, I love Soul Calibur too, and not to de- not to denigrate it at all. But it's not a huge franchise. It, you know, especially even if, especially in the fighting game game community where a game like that should flourish, Soul Calibur is really not looked on with the same kind of competitive fan based eye that you know even another three D fighter like Tekken. Is well, to be as. fair, the Soul Calibur fighting system, and we're, we're jumping into kind of a more deep fighting game discussion, which makes me endlessly happy, um, but Soul Calibur's fighting system, until Soul Calibur 4, and then really, Soul Calibur 4 was only kind of skimming the surface really until the most uh, recent main release, Soul Calibur 5, we didn't have a really, really deep system of being able to chain combos, of having mechanisms for juggling what makes a 3D fighter great is juggling, and, and Tekken really kind of cornered the market on that. Um, and that's as opposed to the kind of head games of a, of a 2D fighter that, that engage you in more. Um, so Soul Calibur is just beginning to reach its potential. And that's part of why I'm so excited about a possible next release. Because I think this, this next one, if they do it right, could be the game to push Soul Calibur into the more mainstream fighting community. Because you're right, it has been the redheaded stepchild of the fighting game community for a really long time. I mean, yeah, it's it's that it's that outcast there and then even in from a popular perspective, if you're going to get a fighting game, I feel like it's Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. Those are the two, you know, it's either you want the stupid, gory, crazy, goofy fun of like a Mortal Kombat X which just came out to, you know, pretty stellar reviews, or you want that, you know, what I grew up with in arcades, that kind of classic just very simple, pretty, you know, user-friendly, child-friendly, you know, Street Fighter. You know, Wait, which you is... were playing Mortal Kombat in arcade too? Oh, I was playing both. <laughs> I was okay, playing okay. Both. okay, hold on. I was, a, I was a Street Fighter guy. Let's not get this confused. Yeah. My Sagat in Street Fighter 2 was pretty darn good. Um, I can vouch for that. It was pretty darn good. <laughs> My Sagat in Street Fighter 4 was pretty good too. Um, but I mean, yeah, I guess I, I never said it. I'm a pretty huge fighting game enthusiast too. I am mm-hmm. more mediocre at, other, at many titles probably than you are, Fliss, but then the ones that I like, I'd say I am... Decent to okay at. Well, I, certainly I had, Marvel vs. Capcom 3, you, you kicked my butt pretty I had, thoroughly. I had my time in the sun at Marvel vs. Capcom. Again, this is getting on another tangent, but I mean, it's a fighting game, but I love it. So Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 was my game. I loved it. I probably sunk 300 plus hours into it. And there was a time at which on the ranked online system, I was probably just a little shy of like the prof- what the, the professionals played at. Um, and so, I mean, that made, me, that made me feel pretty good. I was pretty competent in that system. But no, I'm excited about this. I'm... I'm Maybe I would say if Tokyo Game Show were bigger, we might hear about it there. But then I don't. Does Japan even care about Soul Calibur that much? You know. Yeah. Well, if if they were going to announce that at Tokyo Game Show, I would lose my mind. 
I mean, <laughs> yeah. seriously, you'd, I would be there. I would be there in a Zeke Creed costume. I would be ready to go. Like, you'd bust your way down there. Yeah. yeah. So I guess now we get to the ultimate. Now that you mentioned a certain character, who did you vote for in the poll? Yeah, so this was really hard for me. Um, and I think one of the reasons that we see this poll is because in Soul Calibur V, they tried to kind of make a new generation of characters that were uh, mainly descendants um, to kind of keep the storyline going. And I appreciated that, but it upset a lot of fans. And part of the reason it did that is because there were some characters who were missing. And so when I looked at the list of who to vote for, I was really torn. Do I vote for my actual favorite character or do I vote for a character that I love and was missing in the last game? And so when, I, when it came down to it, I was looking at Siegfried or Talim and I had to choose Siegfried. Yeah, so I i mean, I love Siegfried. I love so many of these characters. Uh, I wanted to vote, vote for, uh, what is it, Voldo, just because he's <laughs> a hilarious character. Uh, but I went with my classic, my my main from Soul Calibur 2. Uh, one of my mains and the rest of the games, too, was Mitsurugi. I think his style, he's just fun, you know, just classic samurai, long katana swordsman. But anyway, so that's been our news and views section. Uh, but we'd love to hear from the community the news items that you guys thought had the biggest impact. We're always looking for new things to discuss, so please feel free to shoot us an email at impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com. I got that wrong last episode, so hopefully no one listed towards the end. So that's impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com. Now, let's put things in perspective. Perspectives is a part of the show, well, when any number of things can happen. In academia, it's when investigators share their opinions with the community at large. Here, Fliss and I are the investigators. Perspective is, is a revolving section where we experiment with what's worth discussing. Usually, Fliss and I will pick out an editorial piece from around the web and discuss it together, which is what we have today. So, Fliss, let's get started. You chose a great piece for us today by Eugenia Hu uh, called Gamer Equality, the Non-Existent Cognitive Disparity Between Genders in Gaming. So just first, before we get into the article at all, what really grabbed you about this article? Well, what absolutely grabbed me right away about this article is that it's tackling a really hot issue in the gaming community right now, which is the way uh, female gamers are included or not included in the community, the way we talk about female gamers, and kind of what we want the community to be. And so it's part of that discussion, and so I was really excited to see that. And then, especially for the two of us, I was really excited that she took a really kind of hard science approach and then added on a science, social science approach over that to, to make a really compelling argument. But can you can you take a minute to kind of tell us what some of the hard science going on here is? Yeah, I'd love to. Anytime that there's a science and games intersection, the inner just scientist and gamer me just gets excited. So I guess if no one can remember the intro, I'm a biomedical scientist currently working on my PhD, and Fliss is a social scientist who has a long-standing academic record and wrote you know, a thesis, or like, a, wrote a you know, thesis work, and he's really just kind of in that sphere. But let me take a step back and talk the biological thing here. Now, as a point of disclaimer, which I should say in science, I'm not a brain scientist. I, I don't, I don't work with the brain. I haven't taken advanced neurology courses, but I would say I'm generally qualified from a basic biological perspective and from a gen- genetic perspective to talk about this. Uh, so, who goes through some great, some great points, uh, talking about the parts of the brain that are um, gender-defined and uh, defined by other factors. So again, in, in general, this article is talking about how there's this perceived cognitive um, disparity between females and males in gaming, that males are inherently more qualified to succeed and excel at playing games because of the way their brains are designed. Um, and that that could explain partially why you don't see as many females in competitive gaming, like on the MOBA scene or the fighting game scene or really any scene like that, and that just inherently females are less, whatever, able to play a game. And a lot of people cite this 3D spatial reasoning that that men are, you know, better at. I'm using quotation figures here, so I guess that's not great for radio, but that men are better at. Um, but I like that she first starts with identifying the parts of the brains that are gender-defined, because there are gender-based differences um, or I guess I should say sex-based differences, 
because gender is a much more complex uh, subject, but uh, sex-based differences in the brain. And so the first part of the brain that's different between males and females is the amygdala. So this is the part of the brain that's really responsible for the three Fs, your fight, flight, and uh, having sex. Um, <laughs> this really kind of defines those drives. Uh, another part of the brain is the hippocampus, which is just generally this kind of exploring the 3D spatial aspect that people talk about, uh, kind of finding your way and no, having this general sense of direction. So it's not a university for hippopotamuses. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's just just the quad angle. That's there. There's the hippo quad, the hippocampus from hippo you. Um, and then there's also the hormone defined parts of the brain. All right, and so. Uh, as many of you probably know, men have much stronger levels of testosterone. Women have much stronger levels of estrogen. And parts of the brain are defined by those hormones. And so the rest of the brain, every single other part of the brain, which is responsible for most of your cognitive and modal functions, so being able to move, are plastic. And so in science, plasticity is this kind of... to think You can think of it as it's malleable. It's like clay. There are factors that can define and shape the brain regardless of gender. So the rest of the brain can com completely be different between men and women, but it can also be different between men and men and women and women and everything in between because you've got the two elements. You've got the genetic basis of your brain, which is defined you know, by your genes. You have two pairs of, you have two alleles, which are two versions of the gene that you get from each of your parents, and that can define traits. And then you also have nurture or environment. And environment can really on a fundamental molecular level, shape the way that your brain operates. So for instance, just as one example, the types of stimuli you're exposed to can change this methylation patterns on your DNA, which can repress or activate certain gene transcription, regardless of your code that you have there, regardless of what any repressors or activators you have inherently in your genome. And so nurture is at some times equally, if not even more important than some of the genetic basis you have. Um, for defining parts of your brain. Uh, and so really, that means that means so much of the human brain shared between males and females is the same and is shaped by experiences and less so by any inherent sex differences or any inherent even genetic differences. Um, she also brings to bear some lower power uh, scientific studies, and I say that because her ends are small and there's limited cohorts of individuals, uh, but still, they have a pretty compelling conclusion that ma both males and females can learn the game at the same rate. So they used Tetris and Medal of Honor as two different examples that it seemed like males started from a baseline higher level of skill, which could be a societal thing, which you'll touch on in a second, but could also be this, this hippocampal spatial reasoning thing. But given the same amount of time with a fresh game, males and females improved at the same rate. And so, again, from a scientific, you know, neuroscience perspective, really demystifying a lot of this, this notion that females are less capable of gaming because of any inherent brain things. But yeah, so then uh, Eugenia goes into this great point about social science. And so, you know, what did you think about how, you know, the impact of society on gaming skill and the gaming community at large? Yeah, so... I think one of the things that you're, you're really getting into here, which is great, is right now we're, we're in a fad where it's really popular to talk about, like, evolution and because evolution. Like, men are this way because of evolution. Women are this way because of evolution. And we're seeing that in things like the paleo diet, which some of which there is some real good science behind it. But, like, we also see this in really the reasoning really toxic groups, right? Like the red pill on Reddit, which if you don't know about it, good. Um, yeah. And... Um, Thank your luck. Right, yeah. So we're seeing ways in which evolutionary science is being twisted in a social context to say this uh, social interpretation of scientific facts, quote-unquote, is the reason for this societal fact. But no, society is the reason for this fact. And so right now, right, we have this perception that there are more male gamers and that men are better at games. And this is, both of those assumptions are not true. If there are more male gamers, there are just slightly more male gamers. Recent uh, studies of consumer polls have shown that we're seeing somewhere between 40 and 48% of games being bought by women. And that's only what those polls are pulling up. So there may be more than that. There may be a little less than that, but it should be somewhere in that range. Right? So yeah, give, means... give or take a standard deviation at most, you're looking easily... Conservatively, I could say you could say 40%. And so that's nearly half. Right. Yeah, exactly. So 
that means that there are girl gamers. We can say just from the numbers, there are women buying games and playing them. And so then we move on to our next percep or perception in society, which is that there are boy games and girl games, right? So people say, okay, girls are buying games, but what are they buying? They're buying like Nintendo, right? And I think that that's also not true. I think that we're seeing um, that both Boys and girls are playing games like Nintendo Dogs, but they're also playing games like Soul Calibur and Street Fighter and Batman and all these other games. There's a big community of it. And so why aren't we seeing more gamers in the public sphere who are women? And that's because our gaming community is not very accepting to them. And that's not just the fault of the community. That's a larger social problem that that games are being represented as a male sphere in popular media. And so, you know, if you go into a toy aisle uh, or the, the toy section at a store, you'll see aisles that are color-coded blue and aisles that are color-coded pink. And this tells you that these toys are for boys and these toys are for girls. And originally, boys' toys are what video games would have been filed under. But since video games moved out of the toy section and moved into the electronic section, right? We now have a gender neutral space for games. And we have we have a space where men and women can come together over games. And most excitingly for me personally is that we're seeing a generation now who that is growing up with games where not only are they growing up with the games in their environment as part of that nurture factor but they're growing up with parents who are proficient at games. So we're seeing gaming being passed down from parent to child now. Yeah, I mean, uh, I live in San Francisco Bay Area, and it's just a mecca here of, it's so great to see. Everywhere you look, I mean, obviously this is kind of like the tech hub, and uh, there's just a lot of different video game stuff here, but you'll see kid, regardless of race, age, gender, sex, anything, every kid is on like the, the iPad playing some game and it's great. It's, it's a way it's removing that barrier, removing that kind of secret club that you and I both experienced back in the day, right? When you and I played games and even to this day, cause we're part of this generation, I'm kind of, it's kind of hard to go out there and say that, Hey, I'm, I'm a gamer. Or I play video games because it's that secret club. I don't want you playing games. This is you Fliss, you and I paid the social toll to play games and we've put in the work and this is our group. And I think a lot of this, oh, women are less good at games, women are less qualified, comes from this place of trying to, you didn't earn your way into our club. Right. And this is a, a problem for a lot of reasons, because I think a lot of the, the women in the gaming community did earn their way to the club. And they, maybe they didn't do it in a very loud way, uh, but they did. And even if uh, they, they even if we, I don't want to even say if they did it, but like, even if we have people in the community who didn't go through the same experiences that we did, I bet, be the, them. I bet the road was even more fraught with peril. I can't even imagine. Yeah. You're already part feel like you're part of a subculture, and then you have the subculture you want to be a part of doesn't want to be have you be a part of it? Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. And so in, in the context of our article here, what it means is that from a very basic level as a community, we have to say there's no scientific evidence for games being a male space. And so if games are a male space, that it's something that society, be it the larger society and the way it represents games and things like game advertising, the way game companies market their games, but then also the society that we gamers are creating is making games a male space. It's because it's something we're doing. It's a choice that we're making, uh, consciously or unconsciously. It's something we're doing. And we need to reevaluate the way we're talking about games, the way we're writing about games, and the way we're treating our fellow gamers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I think who does a great job at kind of deconstructing this. As someone who's been involved with science now for a decade, there's nothing more frustrating, and you know, nothing more nothing more frustrating than when people take science and try to use it in a way that it's not intended, or take a, a fundamental misunderstanding of science and use that in a negative way. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a politics show or a science show necessarily, but I'm not going to get it get into this whole, you know, um, immunizations debate and all, all of that, all of that garbage. Uh, one bad study and everyone gets all paranoid. But no, it's great here. It's great that you, know, you can do def definitively through these through these studies and through just a general basic understanding of neuroscience. Be like, look, 
anybody who claims that on a cognitive or uh, neuronal or you know brain developmental perspective, there's no reason whatsoever, other than the societal the societal influence that you mentioned, that there should be a difference between male and female gamers. Yeah, and what makes me really excited about that is that you know in the social scientists were kind of always struggling for recognition like hey we have a legitimate field hey you need to listen to this stuff this is real um we're, we're always struggling for that and so to have a study like this or an article like this that turns that focus saying okay we've got the, the hard science now we need to move over i, I shouldn't even say hard science. we've got like the the sciencey science to to turn us over to analyzing the way our community talks and what it does and the society we're creating yeah so uh, great, and we could talk about this for hours and hours, but I really recommend everyone give this article a chance and give it a read. So this was posted on the marysue.com, uh, and the author is Eugenia Hu. The article is titled Gamer Equality, the Non-Existent Cognitive Disparity Between Genders and Gaming. It's really, I think it's really worth your time. And please do send us your thoughts. Let us know what you thought about the article. Let us know what you think about the way the gaming community is changing and evolving and where you'd like to see it go. Yeah, and that's at impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com. But now that our work is done and logged, let's get into our experimental methods. In experimental methods, Fliss and I talk about the video games we've been playing recently. No papers or pipettes, cells or senses here, just our words. We'll look at what works, what doesn't, what we're looking forward to testing. So, Fliss, what experiments were you running this week? Well, you know, I've continued uh, slogging my way through Arkham Asylum. I'm still enjoying every minute of it. I have added another 20% to my completion on it, so I'm now well over halfway Not through bad. the game Not on hard bad. mode. Um, last week, we talked about one of the major complaints with that game being the detective mode and the way that's kind of like a turn-on, turn-off, easy mode that you can use. And you mentioned that you felt like you spent too much time in that mode in the game. And it wasn't until you said that, and I went back to playing it during this week, that started hitting me more. And I think that's because I was hitting the, the second um, third of the game, and where things start to really pick up in difficulty. And it really struck me when I did one of those Predator missions, where you're sneaking around and you can't be noticed by the AI. And I, in order to beat it, I had to do the entire mission in detective mode. I couldn't even, you know, like, come out of it for when I knocked somebody out or strung them up under a gargoyle to hang by their ankles. It's just a buzzkill, right? It just kind yeah. of removes that whole feeling. Like, there, you can have some sort of separation. You have a little bit of uncanny valley. You can feel like Batman. But the second you turn on that defect, detective mode, you're like, well, I'm playing a video game. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there are times when I do that to, like, detect enemies where I'm just like, oh, man, I'm like, this is like my spider sense for Batman to, you know, ruthlessly cross my comic book characters. But when I have to do an entire mission in it, and I'm just watching wireframes take out each other, yeah, that is that is definitely a bonus kill. But other than that, still really enjoying that game. Um, moving I on mean, it's a great game. The detective mode is just the one complaint that stands out in my mind. So you're over halfway done? Yeah. Let's, uh, I guess we're, this is still pretty spoiler-free. What was like the last major thing you did? Just to kind of contextualize it for me, trying to remember what exactly happens in that game. Okay, so now I'm hunting around the sewers... I'm trying to stop Poison Ivy, who has... I'm spoiling things here, but whatever, the game is like a billion years old. Stop Poison Ivy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... It came out like 2007. Come on. Come right, on, yeah. I'm trying to stop Poison Ivy, and I'm trying to stop uh, Joker from poisoning the sewers. Nice. Uh, the, the water supply to Gotham. So, um, it's been it's been interesting, because I keep looking at my completion percentage, and I'm like, I feel like I've done a lot. I've already beaten so many villains. Like, what is going to happen next? Um, the is this further than you got in the normal mode? It is, actually. I didn't realize that I only made it just past halfway when I played it my normal playthrough. And I think I think it's just because on normal, it was too easy, and I was moving through it so quickly that it was starting to get samey. Hmm, yeah. Um, but, you know, with hard, like, I'll have to spend a lot more time beating a mission, and that's very satisfying. Um, yeah. I look forward to you powering through it and then jumping into the next one, too. Yeah, well, I'll be sure to let you know. And then Hearthstone, my, my biggest adventure with Hearthstone this week was thinking I accidentally deleted my account and panicking and possibly waking my best friend up at, like, 
three of them. <laughs> no, nah, no. Okay, let's 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 be clear to the audience here. So I got a stream of something like eight texts, seven only seven, seven, only seven. texts from Fliss at freaking four thirty in the morning. I was like, oh my god, what's wrong? Like I was half dazed, half dozed, woke up, saw these, and I just kind of shook my head and went back to sleep. So tell, tell. Please tell the audience, Fliss, how you deleted your Hearthstone data. Okay, so I, I booted it up on my phone, and when I so for a little bit of background, the way I got started at Hearthstone is I got the chance to visit Alex in the Bay Area, and he basically like sat me down and was just like, "You're not moving from this couch until you create a Hearthstone account." And I needed someone else to play with me. Okay, <laughs> it's not too much to ask for. No, and you know, I will always be grateful to you for, for that rather intimidating method of getting me started on the game. <laughs> um, but why don't why don't you have a seat? <laughs> uh, that's my really that's my really bad mob voice. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what that was. Well, you're gonna play Hearthstone, see? We're gonna enjoy ourselves, see? You're gonna make an account, see? That's so Okay, yeah, just better. just go all the way down to nineteen yeah, nineteen twenties gangster. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, so, so I, I made my account in North America, and I'm currently living in Japan, so when I booted it up on my phone most recently, it said, oh, hey, we want you to switch over to this region, to be in, in the Asian region, and I, you know, I'm kind of just, you know, sitting around, and so I'm just like, oh, 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 like, not even thinking about it, and it's, I, it opens up, and it's like, oh, hey, free cards, and I'm just like, wait, what? What, this is the beginning screen. What happened? No! Is my account gone? And I, so I race over to my computer to, like, try and boot up my account and see what happens. And I open it up, and it says, closed for maintenance. Because it was just, like, literally at that moment that they brought Hearthstone down for maintenance for a while. And so I was just like, oh my god, is my account gone? What's happening? I have to tell somebody about this. So, yeah, that's why I, I messaged you. So... Somebody. Now, <laughs> it's all right. I mean, I don't wake up too much later than that anyway. But let's be clear now. Have you been able to log back onto NA? Do you still have your progress? It's all still there. It's completely intact. All right. You wouldn't want to lose that Cho. I mean, come on. Yeah, man. You know, my my precious Laura Walker Cho. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. What, what have you been working on this week? What's going on? So, I want to get into a little more a game that I talked about last time, but let's, just deep, let's do a little deeper dive about Hearthstone. We didn't really talk so much about playing the game itself. Yeah, because you're really into Hearthstone, clearly, since you're, you know, <laughs> sitting me down. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I've still been chugging away at that. But there's been an interesting... So, we talked a little bit about, last week, about Black Rock Mountain, right? That was that infusion of 31 new cards, the new adventure. And a lot of people, myself included, um, thought that the cards that the game introduced would really kind of shake up the metagame or how, you know, the decks that you play against in the ranked mode. And uh, largely it seems to have, it's had an effect, but not really an effect that's dependent on the new cards that were released. So I wrote a perspectives article on the Impact Factor. That's my blog. At, I'll, pl I'll plug this again at the end. That's the impactfactor.blogspot.com. But I wrote a review of the cards, assuming kind of this new archetype would arise. You know, dragon cards were being introduced in Black Rock Mountain, and I really wanted to believe that, you know, if you use these core staple dragon cards that were released with this expansion, that you could really make a competent deck. And it really looked like Paladin was the class to do it, because he had this, this class-specific dragon card. But it seems like largely dragon decks aren't good. Uh, they're... They there, get there aren't out. enough dragons. Uh, it's not even that, though. It's the dragons are too expensive. There's not good low-cost dragons. Because in the early game, your fast decks, like your Face Hunter or your Mech Mage or this new Flame Waker kind of fast tempo mage, they That's outpace you. Really. And they, we get more into that in a second. They outpace you and they kind of beat you on board and get your health really low. And then the control decks, the dragon decks don't have any burst. It's just a consistent, like, you play big things every turn. And so you're going to lose to your control warriors or, you know, your hand locks because a control warrior can drop, can have a uh, death spite equipped and then drop a taskmaster and a grom and deal 16 damage to you in one turn. Or you have your druids that can deal 14 from an empty board or your hand locks that can drop two mountain giant or two molten giants for free and taunt them up and have two nine nine taunters in one turn. Whereas dragon decks don't really have that. They just kind of have to outvalue you. And so it's, 
they don't really have a place in this meta. They lose in the early game, they lose in the late game. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of been a little disheartening. I've been kind of on the ladder, which is the ranked mode, been kind of in between a lot of different decks. Nothing is really working so well for me. Uh, I've been like, I'll win two, lose two, win one, lose two, win three, lose two, you know, something like that. And so I've been kind of sitting at rank 14, um, just kind of trying to play around with what works. And so it's been interesting. I think the meta will shift at some point. I think Dragon cards are a little bit more complex than the Naxxramas cards. Like, when Naxxramas first released, it was pretty clear which cards were going to be good. I mean, Sludge Belcher is, you know, an MVP. He's such a powerful card that, you know, he makes his way into any deck that pretty much isn't a super fast face deck or something that wants to live so long on. But it's a little more complex. Like, where do these Dragon cards fit? Where do these different archetypes fit? And so... Yeah, I've been playing around with stuff. I found a deck, though, that was pretty fun yesterday, and I think with some tweaks could work. But So you mentioned you were playing this Flame Waker Mage deck. Yeah, and I love it. I'm playing a modified version of it. Um, I don't have uh, the Archmage, uh, which is the one legendary feature to that tempo deck. Shibo, shitito, tito. Yeah, so I unfortunately have been forced to substitute a Pyroblast. All right. It's... Which, it's too slow. And I recognize that. I mean, that's one of the problems with Pyroblast as a card, since the nerf. It, it's it's too slow. I would personally advocate for Pyroblast going down to 9 mana again to make it playable again. Um, it was 8 mana originally, um, so I, I would like to see it find a, a nice balance between overpowered and totally useless. Um, but I'm really enjoying it. You know, the it, it has a lot of power. It has a lot of random chance. You've got cards... Um, like Knife Juggler and the Flame Waker that do damage to random enemies. And so that could just be a ton of fun when you drop something and you're just like, come on, please, please, please take this card, please, or please go face. I just want to win. Please go face. Like, <laughs> and you're sitting there, you know, like, you know, making offerings and sacrificing pizza in front of your computer. So it's 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 an incredible amount of fun to play as a deck. And I, I think it actually makes you better as an aggro player because I think that playing that deck if you're if you're trying to improve as an aggro player, it forces you to keep tempo, and I think that that is really valuable because I think it really teaches you how to maintain tempo, and it punishes you for not maintaining tempo. So it's not like the problem, the perceived problem at least, with face hunter, where it's just like press a button, win a game. Like you can mess up really easily with the the aggro mage, the tempo mage, and so that makes it a lot of fun to play. Yeah, just just from my, I built the the tempo mage as I'm building a new deck every day, and I'm just not good at it. I don't know what it is. Like it just doesn't work for me. And I, I don't have Anthonitis either. He's one of the few legendaries I'm missing. But yeah, it's it, it takes a different. <laughs> it takes it takes a different kind of skill, a different kind of like uh, mentality to play the tech. It's not a free win. Now sometimes it can feel like a free win when you, you know, drop an unstable portal and get like a three mana Ragnaros or something, or four mana Ragnaros or something. I, I had I had an amazing amazing opening. Um, where, you know, it was, turn one was Mana Worm, Coin, Mirror Image, turn two, Unstable Portal, and just went on from there. It was just incredible. Because, you know, think about it, right? Like, that is, that's that's four face damage on turn two with a free Unstable Portal creature out. Yeah, that's, that's gross. Though, there was the Face Hunter that I played yesterday that had six damage on turn two. Turn one, he dropped a Worgen Infiltrator, and turn two, Double Abusive Sergeant. God, That's I lost just that not game. Even fair. I lost that game. Yeah, so turn two, I'd taken six damage, and he had three two ones on the board. Yeah, so unless you were playing mage and you were playing that, what, what was arcade it? Arcane explosion. explosion, yeah, which no one plays. Oh god, that was rough. You got to sideboard rough. that, man. You got to sideboard that. There's no sideboard the Hearthstone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I found this deck the other day, and I tweaked it myself. It's a Dragon Warlock deck. Uh, so everyone what? was, yeah, so everyone was like, oh, Dragon Paladin's going to be the thing, because it's got Dragon Consort, it's a really strong card. And then me, I was like, counterculture, I'm like, Dragon Rogue is going to be the thing. What, you going against the, the popular trends? No. I'm pretty innovative. <laughs> I, I, I'm an innovator. Don't be yeah, the brag. Yeah, I'm humble. What are you talking about? Um, but yeah, so I thought Dragon Rogue would be the best, right? Because Hungry Dragon seemed like that super awesome. A four mana, five, six, and it gives your opponent a one drop, and so many one drops have one health. So I'm like, wow, with the Rogue, 
your hero power, you get that one two dagger. You could just attack the one drop for free, and then you get a free four mana five six. That's great. Yeah, but that didn't work. So then I'm like, all right, all right, what's what's gonna work? Warlock, blah blah blah. You, you know, because I thought about Handlock, which used Twilight Drakes already, right. which or dragons. And so I'm like, all right, let's do it. So I built this weird hybrid. It's like half Handlock, half Zoo, half Demon Lock, half I don't even know, just value cards. And it's I like think working your math well. isn't working quite well. Quite no, I think I think I'm the I'm, I'm the I'm the hard scientist here. So I think my math is pretty good. <laughs> I actually have studies with significant statistical power here. Whoa now, shots fired. <laughs> this is yeah. that's almost as ridiculous a statement as you thinking Taskmaster is better than the thing. So uh, you okay, want to bring that up again. Well no, we're not we're not gonna go into that again because it's clear. <laughs> um did you have someone favorite all your tweets that you said how Taskmaster is better? I don't think so. Yeah, but did Taskmaster get with She Hulk? Because I'm pretty sure the thing got with She Hulk, so your what? argument isn't valid. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, Ooh. boom. Just oh. drop some knowledge on you. Oh, God. Oh, Justine's not going to be here. happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, well, why don't, you, why don't you distract yourself from the pain of losing that discussion and uh, tell me more about this, this demon dragon Zulok you're running. Mm, God. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's crazy. So you have, like, early game cards, like Zombie Chow and Dark Bomb. Um, it runs, you know, Implosion because it's so good. It's got near Hellfire, actually has some Demon Fire, too, for early, like, Consecrations. And then late game, it's got Chromagus and Nefarian and Jaraxxus, and it just kind of has, like, it has a really, it has a heavier curve, but it's got some early game stuff. It's kind of got the early game stuff as a handlock, and the late game stuff of something else, and even runs Twisting Nether, which, really? again, again, I guess the audience is probably already lost if we don't listen to Hearthstone, so I apologize. But Twisting Nether is an 8-mana spell, which is too short of the maximum number of mana crystals you can ever have, which is destroy all minions. And it's so bad, no one really likes it. But in this deck, it works, because I play Volcanic Drakes, which are cost-reduced if you know for the number of minions that die that turn. So I can Twisting Nether into free Volcanic Drakes. That's amazing. It's like a Wrath of God that buys you creatures. And I've opened up, like, three freaking golden Twisting Nethers. <laughs> I opened up the first two and disenchanted them, because they're so bad. And then I got the third one, I'm like, alright, fine. And clearly, Hearthstone wants me to have a gold twisting nether. I don't know why. But as soon as I like thought about it, I'm like, alright, this this card's getting some play. And so it's good. I haven't tried it out in ranked mode yet, but I played it in casual for ten games and won I think seven or six. Hey, that's that's a solid winning percentage. So yeah, especially because casual is not so casual. <laughs> There's no mode in Hearthstone that you can play that just lets you mess around and have fun. If you want to mess around and have fun in Hearthstone, really, you just have to be there for the beginning and the middle of the season at low ranks. Like, yeah, by just... mid-season low ranks, yeah, that's when you can actually really test out really, really wacky decks. Yeah, mid and season, just lose a lot and play, like, rank 20 to 15, and you should be okay. Oh, I mean, sorry, I mean, uh, rank, uh, rank uh, I don't know what rank you are, so, uh, yeah, th- those other ranks, whatever rank go, is lower than go, you. Go ahead, go ahead, I <laughs> hate on my rank 15 right now, go ahead and hate that. Now, you're only one rank shy of me, so... I'm coming can't be for talking. you. I'm coming for you, buddy, Max. <laughs> I'm coming. Yeah, so, I mean, Hearthstone will be continue to be a game. Uh, again, we didn't get any feedback from last episode, but if you want to hear more Hearthstone, less Hearthstone, I don't want to be, like, a podcast where all we talk about is that game, since, like, clearly we're going to be playing it all the time. So, again, that's impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com. Let us know if you want us to shut the hell up about Hearthstone. Also, let us know if you are playing Hearthstone and you would like to play against us on Hearthstone, because we would love to play against you on Hearthstone. That would be great. Uh, yeah. So please, please let us know. Yeah. So uh, moving on to another game I, t- I played. I talked about it a little bit last week, but I guess listening back to the episode, I realized I didn't really get a chance to talk about it. But uh, I played through Shovel Knight. But did you complete Shovel Knight? I did. Yeah, I beat Shovel Knight. So I did, you think? did about a playthrough and a half. Shovel Knight is fantastic. So Shovel Knight is a Kickstarter success story. It comes from this team of guys called Yacht, Yacht Club Games. And anyone who has experience with older games, it's immediately apparent that Mega Man is an influence for Shovel Knight. You've got your hero, you've got these these 2D screens where there's platforming, and you attack enemies, and enemies respawn if you move between screens. And So you play as Shovel Knight and his quest to rescue Shield Knight, his you know friend and potentially you know, lover or partner or whatever from the grasp of the evil enchantress and you've got this open world map but there's really eight main stages with eight 
orders of no quarter evil bosses and each has their own unique stage and you make it make your way through their stage and there's checkpoints and enemies and different elements and you can explore through the stages and then get to this end boss and beat them and that's how you progress through the game so anyone who played a Mega Man game will notice this very similar formula you know as opposed to world map Mega Man just has that select screen but you'll have your Mega Man in the center and then the eight bosses surrounding them and you can choose to do those in any order um which is similar for Shovel Knight. But yeah, the game just looks and plays and feels fantastic. The The world is vibrant and fun and beautiful. The gameplay feels extremely solid. There's a little bit of a learning curve. It has that very heavy NES era gravity where your jumps don't really take you as far as you would expect them to take you. And you kind of feel there's no sprint button, so you kind of feel slow. But once you get used to that, it's just, it's very, you know, so satisfying. They included this really great um, hopping mechanic. So you're a shovel knight, so you fight with a shovel. And you can, as jumping, when you're jumping, you can press the down button and you kind of sit on top of your shovel and you can, like, balance on top of things. And so that allows you to traverse, you know, far sections or bounce on top of enemies. And just the, you can really tell the passion that went to this project. No two stages are alike. Every stage has this, you know, novel element that comes out of nowhere. The game is constantly keeping you surprised, and it's just a, a it's just a blast all the way through. It's you know a shorter game. It's you know I think what I beat it I beat my first playthrough in eight hours. And that's really going through and doing everything that I could do. Um, but there's just it's so well designed. It's so energetic. It's so fun. They clearly acknowledged what worked and what didn't from those old games. It just really made this solid package. And, you know, it had been a big hole in my backlog. It was released around the summer of last year for the PC and uh, the Nintendo 3DS. And I just kind of held off on getting it. I wasn't sure about playing on 3DS. I really didn't want to play it on the computer because for a game like that, I absolutely want to play it with a controller. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I loved every second of it. There's certain frustrations, right? Because it's like a Mega Man game, so there's going to be a lot of deaths. You're going to fall down a lot of bottomless pits. You're going to jump and get hit in an enemy in the air and then die. Uh, enemies can kill you really fast, and, you know, it's not really designed. You you don't feel like some action hero. You kind of have to run up and hit an enemy and then run away and dodge. And So there's those certain frustrations that go along with the genre and go along with that kind of nostalgic kind of feel. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Shovel Knight's the best Mega Man game I've ever played. That's, that's really impressive, and... Uh, that's very exciting for me, too, because I love Mega Man games, so I will definitely have to check that out. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, expect to hear a little bit more, more in-depth and more thought out soon on the Impact Factor about Shovel Knight. But will we be seeing a Impact Factor review of Shovel Knight? Uh, it could. It could happen. I gotta write it. I gotta write it. It could happen. Hey, hey Alex, um, when, when do you update the Impact Factor? Yeah, so... I update the Impact Factor on Tuesdays with a new review or article every week, and then on Fridays with news and views, I compile kind of the week's biggest news stories, uh, but more so with an emphasis on the best editorial pieces, the pieces that kind of made me sit down and think about the games um, industry at large. So we've got a little bit of time left, so let's finish up with some odds and ends with the section we call errata. Errata in science is pretty much anything, a little extra bits, little revisions. So is there anything in particular, movies, TV, life, that you feel you want to share with the world? Well, you know, to try and fill the void in my life that is being left by being the only English-speaking person in the world to not know anything about the Avengers purposefully, um, I, I was really excited this morning to watch the new trailer for the Supergirl series. Oh, and I was God. really excited to watch it, and then when I finished it, I was no longer excited. Which Wait, is... I, gotta, I, gotta st- I gotta cut you off. You were excited... You were excited for the a Supergirl TV show. Even without seeing the trailer, the concept of a Supergirl TV show got you excited? Yeah, absolutely it got me excited. The idea oh, of a uh, Supergirl what? TV show absolutely makes me excited. Look, here's the thing. The Superman movies right now are so painfully bad. You like, didn't like Man of Steel or the new trailer, Batman vs. Superman, Black Screen? Yeah, you mean Darkness with a Man of Darkness? If you want to make me watch that movie, the only thing I can say to you is, no! Will you be able to see what happens on screen? Probably not. Yeah, man. So with that hole in my life, that big black screen of not being able to tell what's going on, um, I was excited to to see DC do a TV show. For one thing, Arrow and The Flash are a whole lot of fun. So 
you know, a Supergirl TV show, I was excited going into it. And I'm significantly less excited now that I've seen the trailer. Yeah, so tell us about this fantastic trailer that they released for CBS's Supergirl. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so when you say CBS is Supergirl, you, you kind of nerf some of the excitement right off the bat there. <laughs> I mean, that's like introducing Arrow by just being like, Arrow, shown on the CW, home of beautiful white people TV shows. Like, that's so like... That white people the, being pretty, looking white. The CW. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, see the trailer, right? So we're introduced to Supergirl. We get, like, a kind of stock say goodbye to your parents get launched to earth scene and then we are immediately launched into her being somebody's secretary oh god (laughs) oh man i'd say i don't know anything about the character of supergirl so i mean i can't maybe she was a secretary but yeah so we were talking before the show the trailer for this new supergirl feels like the parody trailer that snl released for the black widow movie like some rom com, like women eat, like, uh, like totally, like, I don't know, I feel reg- not necessarily, I don't want to use regressive, it's a strong term, but just a weird portrayal of a female superhero. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot about Supergirl. Um, I'm guilty of that. You know, I'm, I'm definitely a Marvel, full disclosure. I'm a, I'm a Marvel. Um, but I was still excited about it. You know, the idea of having a show with a female lead character got me, you know, kind of excited. But then, yeah, just like you said, it's it's a very rom com feel. It's not very gritty. Like, it doesn't... I mean, I hate to say it's not very gritty, right? Because, like, you know, we've got all this grit in, in the Superman and Batman film where it's, like, just grit is raining from the sky. But, like, it's not... It's not even gritty in the fact that it's, like, just not even realistic, right? It's just, like, a rom com sunny day. And so that's, you know, that's really frustrating in terms of tone, right? Because... You want there to be some darkness in in your show. You you know you want your character to face some real evil or just some sort of real. I don't know. Just they call it a drama in like the subtitles, like a new CBS drama. But I don't, the only thing dramatic is going to be how much I complain if I ever have to watch that show. And I and I, I maintain that no superhero TV show should ever have a flying character. Why is that? Why do you think it's, they look? It looks horrible. Did you see the trailer when she like flew off? It looks so bad. It looks looks like the original Superman movies. Like we're talking Chris Reeves Superman with him just hold, striking a pose and just kind of the background moving behind him. It don't looks so don't bad. hate on, don't hate on Christopher Reeves Superman movies. Uh, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of those movies, but I think just in general, it looks so bad. It, in Smallville, flying looked bad. Oh, yeah, the Sm- oh, Smallville flying looked terrible. In this trailer, flying looks bad in Supergirl. And then speaking of superhero TV shows, because clearly we can't have enough superhero properties. Um, they, TNT is working on uh, Teen Titans, but as adults, so Titans TV show. Yeah, and let me express exactly how excited I am about that. I am negative excited about that. That actually makes me less happy to be alive as a person that they're working on that. Because I love the Teen Titans, and the I like the comic books. I love the cartoon. I got started on it with the cartoon. Um, I sail away on the Beast Boy Terra ships and on the Beast Boy Raven ships. Absolutely. Poor Beast Boy. He doesn't get enough love. Uh, but no, I, I'm just, I mean, first of all, it's TNT, but like, even beyond that, it just looks awful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, if there's going to be a show with that, like, fun, kind of funny thing, I think Teen Titans would have been a perfect property for that. Because they're teenagers. You could have them just goof around and being fun, like like the cartoon. But I assume this will probably be a grittier interpretation. You know, World maybe some... down, Alex. I know. They have to do nothing... real things like pay electric bills. Yeah, nothing in life is fun when you're an adult. I don't know. I don't know. I guess I guess we sound you know kind of hypocritical here, saying we wish you wish Supergirl was more gritty, but then Teen Titans probably gonna be too gritty. So who knows? I think it's just superhero fatigue, honestly. Like I guess you haven't seen it yet, but I enjoyed. It. Avengers Age of Ultron, it was good, it was fun, but, like, it just, I'm fatigued. Yeah, you know, I actually, you know, a movie that, uh, from, a, from a property that I know you hate, but The the Amazing Spider-Man 2 actually was one of the most refreshing superhero movies for me in a while. Oh because, my god. Because. Oh my god. Because, we don't even have because, time to get into because, this. Because, 
it was just a small scale. And if you go into that movie feeling like, okay, this Small is, scale? There's like 20 villains in it. Okay, yes, but, like, it's just about Peter. It's just about New York, right? Like, it's not the world. It's not three flying helicarriers gunning down all the people that might be a threat uh, to Hydra, which I love. Don't get me wrong. Captain America Winter Soldier was great, but it was just a small scale. And yes, that was a terrible movie, but it was refreshing in that it was just a more personal struggle. And yes, right, the person good. who was struggling was a jerk who I didn't really like, who had really mixed up sets of priorities. But beyond that, it was that little piece of it was refreshing for me. Nothing about that movie is redeemable. Ooh, I, God, we're going to have to rename this, not the impact factor, but Fliss and Alex disagree about comic book stuff. But anyway, yeah, so that's it for Rata. If there's any TV movies you guys want to give us a watch and talk with us about, please let us know. Yeah, absolutely, because it's clear we, we love this stuff, and we'd love to complain about it, and we'd love to hear you talk about it and complain about it. Um, and also to continue to hear, you know, why the thing is better than Taskmaster, you know, for He's reasons not. other than She-Hulk. Um, <laughs> He's not. Who is amazing, an amazing character in her own right, right? So if she has that good taste in men... We can agree on that. She-Hulk yeah. she is a good character. She-Hulk is a great character. All right, so that, that's a great note. You know, it's awesome, but it's hard to believe that our second show is in the books. And you know what? I think it was better the second time. Uh, please keep in touch on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at the C Fliss. That's at T-H-E-C-F-L-I-S-S. -S. I try to keep up um, more and more stuff from Japan. I'm trying to take photos of my school lunch every day, which is surprisingly interesting, especially if you want to see kids eating, um, you know, all kinds of crazy sea vegetables, um, which is what I frequently get served. So yeah, it's a lot of fun, and you know, we also post our thoughts about comic books there, so please let us know what's up. Yeah, no mystery meat in those pictures. But anyway, thank you everyone for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. If you're hearing the show, chances are you found it on our SoundCloud page, so that's soundcloud.com slash theimpactfactor, that's all one word. For an archive of of our old episodes, you can check us out on our YouTube channel by searching the Impact Factor uh, video games on YouTube. Uh, we need 500 subscribers to have a custom channel URL, so that'll be a while. So just search that and you should be able to find us. Uh, the Impact Factor is an extension of my blog about video games, theimpactfactor.blogspot.com. So check there every Tuesday for a new review or article, and every Friday for my curation of the best written pieces from around the world in gaming. Uh, so please, again, send us any comments and suggestions for the podcast to impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, be sure to follow me on Twitter at Alex Samoha. That's Alex S-A-Mocha, like the coffee. And so, until next time, make an impact. <laughs>